So natural populations can sustain certain amounts of variation. And the amount of variation that a natural population can sustain is related to both the population size and the mutation rate. As you have large populations or a high influx of variation through mutation, a population can sustain more variation. Now there are ways of estimating mathematically from DNA sequences or from some other sort of surrogate how much variation a population should be able to sustain. When we see deviations from that expectation, we can infer if something interesting is going on, such as a particular kind of natural selection or say the population size is growing or shrinking. So let's look a little bit at the math and I'll give you a couple of natural examples. Now these are some statistics that we use for looking at variation in natural populations. One of them is pi. Pi is the average pairwise difference among individuals. That if you look at all individuals in a population one by one, so individual one versus individual two, individual one versus individual three, on average, how much do they differ? S is very similar. S is the number of variable sites. That when you look at all the population at once now, how many sites in a long DNA sequence are there that are variable? Now, there is an expectation for pi, for this measure over here, that's related to S. This expectation is referred to as theta. And this is when there's nothing else going on, when you have a purely neutral population where the only things happening are mutation and drift. The expectation of pi is S, as we just said before, divided by the summation from 1 to n minus 1 of 1 over i. n in this case is the number of sequences that you're looking at. So using this, you can say that in a, in a standard population with nothing interesting happening, here's the expectation of pi of what it should be. Now, pi may not be right at this expectation. And there's a measure, and this, is, this measure is referred to as Tejima's D. Now, Tejima's D is a normalized version of pi, the observed, minus theta, the expected value. So let's look at a couple of DNA sequences so you can see what I'm referring to here. Here's a population that's pretty close to what you might expect at, a, at sort of a natural steady state. So I'm looking at five sequences. Let's just pretend that, the, that these individuals are haploid just for the sake of argument. And you see, you know, individual 5 differs from individual 4 by 1 base, right? Individual 5 differs from individual 3 at 2 bases, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There are three segregating sites, this site, this site, and this site. So S here is 3, and we have a distribution of pairwise differences. So looking across this population, if you were to compare 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 1 to 5, 2 to 3, 2 to 4, 2 to 5, 3 to 4, 3 to 5, 4 to 5, you'd have this distribution. See, the only ones that are identical here, the only ones which have zero differences, are individuals 2 and 3. So if you were to draw a diagram of the relationships here, you might say, okay, individuals 2 and 3 are identical, individual 1 differs by one base, individual 4 differs by one base, and individual 5 differs by another base. So 5 differs from 1 at 3 sites, as you see over here, so 1, 2, 3. Right? Individual 4 differs from 2 and 3 at 1. And you see the bulk of the population here is pretty closely related, but there's some variation. And there's a few there on the outskirts. So the, a, the pi, looking at this, the average pairwise difference is probably something around 1.5. I don't know the exact number, but it's close to that. That's just the average of this distribution. So this would be, for example, a neutrally evolving population. Now let's think about a couple of different scenarios. Let's imagine, hypothetically, rather than a neutrally evolving population, let's say that there was... Um, an event which removed all variation. So either, for example, the population was very small for a long time and then grew, right? So while it was small, it lost all variation and then grew, so now it's beginning to get some back. Or there was a selective sweep, which removed all the variation. So for example, this, this you know, individual fives combination of T, G, and G spread throughout the population, and all variation was, was removed. You might then have a situation that looks more like this afterwards. So in this case, you know, we only have one segregating site in this particular in this particular set of sequence, so there's not very much there. And you know, the that what would the distribution of differences look like? Most of the individuals here are identical, right? So this is now relative to that original distribution I showed you before, which was more almost normal looking. This one's very much skewed over to the left. Most individuals are identical, and then those that are not differ by one. So in this particular population, you have individuals two, three. 4 and 5 are all identical, and 1 is different. If you were to look at a lot more sequences, this is obviously a very small number of sequences, you might expect, you know, most individuals are very similar, and you have a couple of offshoots here and there. But you don't have these ones that are multi-steps away so much. I mean, you just have a couple here like that. There are very few like that. 
This now has a lot less you know, variation than you might expect from a normal population. So this is a case that if you were to apply to GMS D, the amount of observed variation is very low relative to what you might expect. So in this case, you would have a negative to GMS D. And in fact, if you actually apply this to GMS D formula to that, it comes out pretty close to around negative 1 or so. Okay? So that gives you some idea of that. Now let's take the other scenario. This is a case where there's too little variation. You have that everybody, there's, everybody, it's too homogeneous. Now let's imagine a case instead, like this. In this case now, you have two common haplotypes, right? So here, individuals 1, 2, and 3 are very similar. One differs from the other two, but just by one. But you have this, this set that are closely related, and you have this other set that are closely related, but they're very different from each other. So if you were to look at the pairwise comparisons, rather than being sort of normal looking, in this case it's actually bimodal. Right? That we have, you know, within the groups they differ by zero or one, whereas between the groups they differ by three or four. So it's a very bimodal looking distribution. So if you were to if you were to draw it out in this particular case, you have individuals four and five over here, and you have you know multiple steps to get over here to individuals two, three, and one. In this case, you actually have more variation, more spread in variation than you would expect. So the, your observed variation is too high relative to your expected. So in this case, you have a, t, a to G minus D that is positive rather than negative. So in this case, you see that what's happening here, that, that you have these two different sets. So naturally speaking, what might cause this? Well, there's two right off the cuff things you could say. One would be balancing selection, where there are two distinct types that are favored but are, but are distinct from each other. So you have variation within the two types, but you have a big difference between them. The alternative is that you actually started with a big population that suddenly contracted. That maybe, historically, rather than looking like this, there were a lot of other individuals here in the middle to make it more like that original population I showed you, but they were lost in the process of this population shrinking. So if, the, if it's the latter case, if the population stays small, you will go back fairly quickly to having the standard neutral expectation, but with less variation overall. Okay? Well, I hope that's helpful in terms of just giving you an idea of what's going on. Again, the GMS D is a normalized version of the observed amount of variation calculated as pi from that expected. The expected amount comes from knowing the number of variable sites and the number of sequences you're looking at. And again, if the GMS D is negative, then that suggests that you could have had either uh, selection or moving variation. Or it could suggest that you had a recent population expansion, such that you, you don't have as much variation as the population should be able to sustain. Whereas if the GMS D is positive, that could suggest that you have selection maintaining variation. Or you had a recent population contraction. I hope that's helpful, and thanks for your time. And one question, is the first example neutral? Yes, the first example okay. I showed was neutral, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.